A stunning question with many possible answers to change our entire outlook on history is, who are the Anunnaki? It's not uncommon for answers to be found within the ancient record, but what is uncommon is the spread into popular culture. The idea that a group of beings, known as the Anunnaki, came to the earth many thousands of years ago and directly affect and influence the earth so much that in the today and now we still see symbols and signs of their existence here. The signs are everywhere. The writing is on the wall. Wait till you hear this. If Sumerian accounts are to be trusted and the translations of the ancient texts are at least close in their accuracies, then what we have in the cuneiform tablets are the most well-preserved documentations regarding the prehistory of our people. Of course, we are still learning, still connecting the dots, but our overview regarding our existence on the Earth is a serious example into our loss of history and indeed our memory loss. It would appear that in some way, we are still adapting to this planet. The question should be, how did we get here? And what the hell are we doing here exactly? And maybe the answers can be found in the Anunnaki question. If you consider the Great Ark, you can also stubbornly leave the door open in the Ark not being a boat, but being that of a space-faring vessel that crashed into the Earth's ocean, bringing with it the ingredients for human life. Our ancient writings were brought as well as this gives us a basic grasp on the past when we consider the gods. This could be the effort to remember. The story begins about a half million years in the past. Astronauts from another planet came to Earth in search of gold. Splashing down in one of the Earth's seas, they waded ashore and established Eridu, home in the far away. In time, the initial settlement expanded to a full-fledged mission Earth with a mission control center, a spaceport, mining operations, and even a way station on Mars. Short of manpower, the astronauts employed genetic engineering to fashion primitive workers. That was us. The deluge that catastrophically swept over the Earth required a fresh start. The Anunnaki became gods, granting mankind civilization, and taught us some of the secrets of the universe. Then, about 4,000 years ago, all that had been achieved unraveled in a nuclear calamity brought about by the visitors to Earth in the course of their own rivalries and wars. But what had preceded the events on Earth, what had taken place on the Anunnaki's own planet, Nibiru, that caused the space journeys, the need for gold, the creation of man. What emotions, rivalries, beliefs, morals motivated the principal players in the celestial and space sagas? What were the relationships that caused mounting tensions on Nibiru and on Earth? What tensions arose between old and young, between those who had come from Nibiru and those born on Earth? And to what extent was what had happened determined by destiny, a destiny whose record of past events holds the key to the future? Would it not be auspicious where one of the key players, an eyewitness, and one who could distinguish between fate and destiny, to record for posterity the how and where and when and why of it all, the first things and perhaps the last things? But this is precisely what some of them did do, and foremost among them was the very leader who commanded the first group of the Anunnaki. Scholars and theologians alike now recognize that the biblical tales of creation of Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden, the deluge, the Tower of Babel, were based on texts written down millennia earlier in Mesopotamia, especially by the Sumerians. And they, in turn, clearly stated that they obtained their knowledge of past events, many from a time before civilization began, even before mankind came to be from the writings of the Anunnaki, those who from heaven to earth came, the gods of antiquity. As a result of a century and a half of archaeological discoveries in the ruins of the ancient civilizations, especially in the Near East, a great number of such early texts have been found. The finds have also revealed the extent of missing text, so-called lost books, 
which are either mentioned in discovered text or are inferred from such text or that are known to have existed because they were cataloged in royal or temple libraries. Sometimes the secrets of the gods were partly revealed in epic tales, such as the Epic of Gilgamesh, that disclosed the debate among the gods that led to the decision to let mankind perish in the deluge, or in a text titled Atrahasis, which recalled the mutiny of the Anunnaki, who had toiled in the gold mines that led to the creation of primitive workers, the earthlings. From time to time, the leaders of the Anunnaki themselves authorized compositions, sometimes dictating the text to a chosen scribe. As the text called the Era Epos, in which one of the two gods who had caused a nuclear calamity sought to shift the blame to his adversary, sometimes the god acted as his own scribe, as the case regarding the Book of the Secrets of Thoth, the Egyptian god of knowledge, which the god had secreted in a subterranean chamber. When the Lord God Yahweh, according to the Bible, granted the commandments to his chosen people, he at first inscribed in his own hand two stone tablets that he gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. When Moses threw down and broke the first set of tablets in response to the golden calf incident, the replacement set was written by Moses on the tablets, on both their sides when he stayed on the mount 40 days and 40 nights, recording the dictated words of the Lord. Were it not for a tale recorded on papyrus from the time of the Egyptian king Khufu concerning the books of the secrets of Thoth, the existence of that book would have not become known. Were it not for the biblical narratives in Exodus and Deuteronomy, we would never have known about the divine tablets and their contents all would have become part of the enigmatic body of lost books whose very existence would have never come to light. No less painful is the fact that in some instances we do know that certain texts had existed but are in the dark regarding their contents. Such is the case regarding the Book of the Wars of Yahweh and the Book of Dasher, Book of Righteousness, which are specifically mentioned in the Bible. In at least two instances, the existence of olden books, earlier texts known to the biblical narrator, can be inferred. Chapter 5 of Genesis begins with the statement, This is the book of the Toldot of Adam. The term Toldot being usually translated as generations, but more accurately meaning historic or genealogical record. The other instance is in chapter 6 of Genesis, where the events concerning Noah and the deluge begin with the words, These are the Toldot of Noah. Indeed, partial versions of a book that became known as the Book of Adam and Eve have survived over millennia in Armenian, Slavonic, Syriac, and Ethiopian languages, and the Book of Enoch, one of the so-called apocryphal books that were not included in the canonized Bible, contains segments that are considered by scholars to be fragments from a much earlier book of Noah. An example of the extent of lost books is that of the famed Library of Alexandria in Egypt. Established by the general Ptolemy after Alexander's death in 323 BC, it was said to have contained more than half a million volumes, books inscribed on a variety of materials. The great library where scholars gathered to study the accumulated knowledge was burnt down and destroyed in wars that extended from 48 BC to the Arab conquest in 642. What has remained of its treasure is a translation of the first five books of the Hebrew Bible into Greek and fragments retained in the writings of some of the library's resident scholars. It is only now that we know the second king Ptolemy commissioned in 270 BC an Egyptian priest who the Greeks called Manetho to compile the history and prehistory of Egypt. At first Manetho wrote only the gods reigned there, then demigods, and finally in 3100 BC Pharaonic dynasties began. The divine reigns he wrote began 10,000 years before the flood and continued for thousands of years thereafter the latter period having witnessed battles and wars among the gods. The beginning of the human journey and our understanding of where this journey began can only be traced through interpretations of ancient text that were almost lost to us. 
This very journey in which we are on has a seemingly destructive end, and perhaps answers to the past can be found in the outcome of the future. Yet, at the same time, we can learn from this time to better plan out the future of our people. These very ancient things do still exist, and the people of the past have written down for us their understanding of who we are. This isn't news, we are all aware of this, yet for some reason, we as a people are not accepting the ancient texts as being accurate accounts of events that had actually happened. The very idea that our entire civilization is corrupt isn't news either. But maybe, just maybe, there are at least some truths to be found in these very ancient writings. The people who made these documents were not fools. They were not lying either. Why would they? Manetho took to his task and begins describing a time 10,000 years before the Great Flood occurred. The divine rains, he wrote, began 10,000 years before the Flood and continued for thousands of years thereafter. The latter period having witnessed battles and wars among the gods. In the Asiatic domains of Alexander, where rain fell into the hands of the general Seleucus and his successor, a similar effort to provide the Greek savants with a record of past events took place. A priest of the Babylonian god Marduk, Barassus, with access to libraries of clay tablets, whose core was the temple library of Haran, now in southeastern Turkey, wrote down in three volumes a history of gods and men that began an eye-watering 430, 32,000 years before the deluge when the gods came to earth from the heavens. Listing by name and reign duration the first ten commanders, Barassus reported that the first leader waded ashore from the sea. He was the one who gave mankind civilization, and his name, rendered in Greek, was Kans. Devotingly, in many details, both priests thus rendered accounts of gods of heaven who had come to earth, of a time when gods alone reigned on earth, and of the catastrophic flood that almost ended the human struggle. In the fragmentary bits and pieces retained in other contemporary writings from the three volumes, Barassus specifically reported the existence of writings from before the Great Flood stone tablets that were written for safekeeping in an ancient city called Sippar, one of the original cities established by the ancient gods. Though Sippar, as were other pre-diluvial cities of the gods, was overwhelmed and obliterated by the deluge, a reference to the pre-diluvial writings surfaced in the annals of the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal, who reigned between 668 and 633 BC. When archaeologists in the mid-19th century found the ancient Assyrian capital Nineveh, until then known only from the Old Testament, they discovered in the ruins of Pallas a library with the remains of some 25,000 inscribed clay tablets. An assiduous collector of these so-called olden texts, Ashriel Benipal boasted in his annals, The God of scribes has bestowed on me the gift of the knowledge of his art. I have been initiated into the secrets of writing. I can even read the intricate tablets in Sumerian. I understand the enigmatic words in the stone carvings from the days before the flood. It is now known that the Sumerian civilization had blossomed in what is now Iraq, almost a millennium before the beginning of the dynastic period in Egypt, both to be followed later by the civilization of the Indus Valley in the Indian subcontinent. It is now also known that the Sumerians were the first to write down the annals and tales of gods and men, from which all other peoples obtain the tales of creation, of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, the deluge, the Tower of Babel, and of the wars of the gods, as reflected in the writings and collections of the Greeks, Hittites, Canaanites, Persians, and even the Indo-European cultures. As these old writings attest, their sources were even earlier texts, some found, many lost, most as if they never even existed in the first place. The volume of such early writings is staggering. Not thousands, but tens of thousands of clay tablets 
have been discovered in the ruins of the ancient Near East. Many record aspects of daily life, whilst others found mostly in palace libraries, constitute royal documentation. Yet there are some discovered in the ruins of temple libraries or of scribal schools that constitute a group of canonized text, a secret literature, that were written down in the Sumerian language and then translated to Akkadian, the first Semitic language, and then other ancient languages. And even in those early writings, going back almost 6,000 years, references are made to lost texts inscribed on stone tablets. Among the incredible finds in the ruins of ancient cities and their libraries are clay prisms inscribed with the very information about the 10 pre-diluvial rulers and their 432,000 years total reign to which Barassus had referred. Known to us as the Sumerian King List, now on display at the Ashmolean Museum in the UK, their several versions have no doubt that their Sumerian compilers had access to some earlier common or canonized textual material, coupled with other equally earlier text discovered in various states of preservation, they strongly suggest that the original record of the arrival, as well as preceding events, and certainly of following events, had to be one of those leaders, a key participant, an eyewitness. One who had been an eyewitness to all those events, indeed a key participant in them, was the leader who had splashed down with the first group of the Anunnaki. At that time, his name was E.A., he whose home is water. He experienced the disappointment of having command of Earth mission given to his half-brother and rival Enlil, Lord of the Command, a humiliation little mitigated by granting him the title NK-1, Lord of Earth, relegating away the cities of the gods and their spaceport in the E-Den, Eden, to supervise the mining of gold in Abzu, southeastern Africa. It was E.A. Enki, a great scientist, who came across the hominids who inhabited those parts. And so when the Anunnaki toiling in the gold mines mutinied and said, no more, it was he who realized that the needed manpower could be attained by jumping the gun on evolution through genetic engineering, and thus did the Adam, literally meaning he of the earth, earthling, come into being. As a hybrid, the Adam could not procreate. The events echoed in the biblical tale of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden record the second genetic manipulation by Enki that added the extra chromosomal genes needed for reproduction. And when mankind did not turn out the way it had been envisioned, it was he, Enki, who defied his brother Enlil's plan to let mankind perish in the deluge. The events whose hero has been called Noah in the Bible and Zayu Sudra in the early original Sumerian text. The first son of Anu, Nibiru's ruler, Enki was well versed in his planets and its inhabitants past. An accomplished scientist, he bequeathed the most important aspects of the advanced knowledge of the Anunnaki, especially to his two sons, Marduk and Ningish Zeta, who, by the way, as Egyptian gods, are thought to have been known as Ra and Thoth. But he also was also instrumental in sharing with mankind certain aspects of such advanced knowledge by teaching two selected individuals the secrets of the gods. In at least two instances, such initiates wrote down as they were instructed to do those divine teachings as mankind's heritage. One called Adapa and probably a son of Enki by a human female is known to have written a book titled Writings Regarding Time One of the Earliest Lost Books. The other called In Meduranki was in all probability the prototype of the biblical Enoch, the one who was taken up to heaven after he had entrusted to his sons the Book of Divine Secrets, and of which a version has probably survived in the extra-biblical Book of Enoch. Though the firstborn of Anu, he was not destined to be his father's successor on the throne of Nibiru, complex rules of succession, which reflected the convoluted history of the Nibirians, 
gave that privilege to Inky's half-brother, Enlil. In the effort to resolve the bitter conflict, both Inky and Enlil ended up on a mission to an alien planet. Earth, whose goal was needed to create a shield for preserving Nibiru's dwindling atmosphere. It was against that background, made even more complex by the presence on Earth of their half-sister Ninharsag, that Inki decided to defy Enlil's plan to have mankind perish in the cataclysmic occurrence of a flood that engulfs the entire planet. You have to consider that if our education is wrong, then our entire outlook is wrong. But what's the point? Why are we in the dark? What is it exactly that is going on? The story of the Anunnaki is a stunning tale of past events that occurred on this planet in the very ancient and remote past. Maybe, just maybe, the answers to who we are can be found in the Anunnaki question. The cuneiform texts that are now found corroborate the Bible epics of creation and destruction. They appear to confirm the stories of the Bible with the exception of the name changes. And they appear to confirm to us that everything we have ever been told to be either a myth or a religious fantasy is in fact actual records of the history of our people, our struggle, our tribulations, and also how we came to be. In Genesis, the story goes that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. These words are echoed from much more ancient writings, from which themselves are older than time as we accept it. The existence of these very ancient writings are mentioned in the cuneiform tablets, from which the writings are less removed and rewritten, meaning that their accuracy is likely to be more accurate than the Genesis narrative, and also without the exclusion of certain ancient texts that provide details of who we are. Great conflicts carried on between the two half-brothers' sons, and this spread to their children and even among their grandchildren. The fact that all of them, and especially those born on Earth, faced the loss of longevity, possibly due to environmental changes that we are still adapting to in modern times, added to personal agonies and sharpened ambitions. It all came to a climax in the last century of the 3rd millennium BC when Marduk, Inki's firstborn, claimed that he, and not Enlil's firstborn son, Ninurta, should inherit the earth. The bitter conflict that included a series of wars led in the end to the use of highly destructive weapons with nuclear capabilities. The unintended result was the demise of the Sumerian civilization. The initiation of chosen individuals into the secrets of the gods had marked the beginning of priesthood, the lineages of mediators between the gods and the people, the transmitters of the divine words to the mortal earthlings. Oracle's interpretations of divine utterances were commingled with the observations of the heavens for omens. And as mankind was increasingly drawn to take sides in the godly conflicts, prophecy began to play a role. Indeed, the term to denote such spokesmen of the gods who proclaimed what was to come, Nabi was the epithet for Marduk's firstborn son, Nabu, who had tried on behalf of his exiled father to convince mankind that the heavenly signs bespoke the coming supremacy of Marduk. These developments sharpen the realization that one must distinguish between fate and destiny. The proclamations of Enlil, sometimes even of Anu, that used to be unquestioned, were now subjects to the scrutiny of the difference between Nam, a destiny, like the planetary orbits, whose course had been determined and was unchangeable, and Nam Tar, literally a destiny that could be bent, broken, change, which was fate. Reviewing and recalling the sequence of events and the apparent parallelisms between what had happened on Nibiru and what took place on Earth, Inki and Enlil began to ponder philosophically what indeed was destined and could not have been avoided and what was just fated as a consequence of right or wrong decisions and free choice. 
The latter could not be predicted. The former could be foreseen, especially if all, as the planetary orbits, was cyclical. If what was shall be, if the first things shall also be, the last things. The climate event of the nuclear desolation sharpened soul searching among the leaders of the Anunnaki and raised the need to explain to the devastated human masses why it came to pass this way. Was it destined or was it just the result of an Anunnaki made fate? Was anyone responsible? Is there someone accountable? In the councils of the Anunnaki on the eve of the calamity, it was Inki who stood alone in opposition to the use of the forbidden weapon. It was thus important for Inki to explain to the suffering that turning point in the saga of extraterrestrials who had meant well but ended as destroyers had come to pass. And who but Inki, who was the first to come and an eyewitness to it all, was most qualified to tell the past so the future could be divined. And the best way to tell it all was as a first person report by Inky himself. Inky recorded a long text stretching over at least 12 tablets discovered in the library in Nippur, quotes Erki as saying, when I approached earth, there was much flooding. When I neared its green meadows, heaps and mounds were piled up at my command. The long text continues to describe how Inky then assigned task to his lieutenants, putting their mission to Earth in motion. Numerous other texts that relate varied aspects of Inky's role in the ensuing development serve to complete Inky's tale. They include a cosmogony, an epic of creation, at whose core lay Inky's own text, which scholars call the Eridu Genesis. They include detailed descriptions of the fashioning of the atom. They describe how other Anunnaki male and female came to Inki in his Eridu to obtain from him the Mi, a kind of data disk that encoded all aspects of civilization. And they include texts of Inki's private life and personal problems, such as the tale of his attempts to attain a son by his half-sister Ninharsag his promiscuous affairs with both goddesses and the daughters of man, and the unforeseen consequences thereof. The Atrahasis text throws light on Anu's efforts to prevent a flare-up of the inky Enlil rivalries by dividing Earth's domains between them, and texts recording the events preceding the deluge render almost verbatim the debates in the Council of the Gods about the fate of mankind and Inky's subterfuge known to us as the tale of Noah and the Ark, a tale known only from the Bible until one of the original Mesopotamian versions was found in the tablets of the Epic of Gilgamesh. Sumerian and Akkadian clay tablets, Babylonian and Assyrian temple libraries, Egyptian, Hittite, and Canaanite myths, and the biblical narratives are the main body of written down memories of the affairs of gods and men. For the first time ever, this dispersed and fragmented material has been assembled to recreate the eyewitness account of Inki, the memoirs and insightful prophecies of a god, presented as a text dedicated to Inki to a chosen scribe, witnessing to be unsealed at an appropriate time, it brings to mind Yahweh's instructions to the prophet Isaiah in the 7th century BC. Now come, write it on a sealed tablet, as a book, engrave it. Let it be a witnessing until the last day, a testimony for all time. Isaiah 38. Comments below guys, and as always, thank you for watching.